The title of tonight's uh, talk is Ivoryville Boot Camp. And we just wanted to go over field methods. In here, I just wanted to point out what one of the great things in Marty and, and the other, I, I think I can say we're old timers. Uh, the photo of me on the right was when it was uh, literally 100 degrees in the woods. And with the new materials, uh, it was very comfortable. So it, it's not your, your dad or your granddad's or your grandmother. Uh, it's just the, the equipment out there is so much better. So that's, we're, we're mostly, you know, walking through the woods and, and with a kayak. Uh, so we're just thrilled to have you all here tonight and we'll continue on. So Lauren and I have started two organizations. One's the Louisiana Wilds, which basically we've been setting the relationships and uh, talking around the state to get interest up in ivory bills and cougars too. Uh, that's the four-legged thing. Uh, but that's more our relational uh, organization. Tonight we're here for Mitch and Ivory Bill. And to set this up, uh, Lauren and I are always looking for analogies. So this is a great theme from Moneyball and uh, Brad Pitt, the, his character on the right. But listen to what Wash says about, uh, I think this is analogous to what's going on to how difficult it is with the Ivory Bill. But the thing, the thing is, is... Uh... You don't know how to play first base. Scott? That's right. It's not that hard, Scott. Tell him, Wash. It's incredibly hard. Hey, anything <laughs> worth doing is, and we're going to teach you. <laughs> so I wanted to emphasize there that, that <clears throat> basically the extinction narrative, and I'll just call it that, and again, that's, that might sound cheap, but the side that thinks it's really easy to find ivory bills, that they're just like any other bird, uh, I'm with Wash on this. It's incredibly difficult. But I do want to say that the hopeful part with Brad Pitt about uh, anything that's, that's hard is worth learning and will teach you. And I want to be very clear that even though I've been doing this full time since 2019 and I grew up in northeast Louisiana, I didn't grow up in the hunting culture. My father was from Brooklyn. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think one of the disconnects is Searching for ivory bills is not at all like bird watching. It is much more like hunting, particularly deer hunting and, and turkey hunting. So we're here to start maybe the teaching process. And this, again, uh, I'm learning as much as anyone. I've been out in the field so much that I've, I've, I've as I've said, I'm the emperor of ignorance and the uh, king of questions. Uh, I do have my own opinions and we've been successful out there, but we're always looking to learn from people. So. To set it up, the challenges of ivory bill searching, again, most of you have been here, but IBWO, it's bird banding um, <clears throat> code. So IBWO is ivory bill and pileated friends, pileated woodpeckers, P-I-W-O. So the challenges of searching for is the nature of the bird, uh, extremely rare and extremely shy. They were hunted uh, once they became <clears throat> rare in the 1880s. Um, and it's we won't relitigate this, but uh, it's a question of how, if the bird were, were ever common. But um, as their numbers were reduced, there was quite a uh, pressure for collecting specimens and the birds were hunted for sustenance too. So the birds, uh, I think you had two types of ivory bill woodpeckers in 1880, and that was loud ivory bill woodpeckers and quiet ivory bills. And I think by the 20th century, you only had quiet uh, uh, ivory bills. So the nature of the habitat, very remote, swampy uh, with swampy critters. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've never seen a birder in the woods where we've looked for ivory bills. So that's another, I think, misleading aspect is that birders would see ivory bills and there would be reports of them. Uh, Jeff Hill really deals with, with that very well in his book. The hostility against finding ivory bills, again, I'm always looking for people who, uh, who want to argue the other side, but there isn't much support for ivory bill searches, uh, and I'll talk more about that later. I, again, I'm looking for other people on the other side, maybe if they can engage in a dialogue. And the special interest aligned against proving ivory bill persistence, um, <clears throat> again, that, that's my own speculation. I won't really go into that deeply tonight. Next week, I will start uh, giving my opinion about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we'll talk about that fighting for the ivory bill. I will say this, that 
it's become apparent to me that that there aren't many or I will frankly I don't know of any other organization that's really fighting for the ivory bill I think it would be disastrous if the ivory bill were declared extinct and delisted uh, uh, so uh, I'll say more of that for next week Arthur Allen invented field ornithology as a discipline with the ad when he created the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in 1915. And James Tanner, who wrote as what we've said would be the, the book on the Ivory Bill Woodpecker that was published in 1942, which was a monograph of his thesis from Cornell. Dr. Allen was James Tanner's principal professor. So the 37, 1937 article that Drs. Allen and Kellogg, both from Cornell, wrote about recent observations of the ivory bill woodpecker, described their observations both in Florida, well, Allen's observations in Florida in 1924, and then the Singer Tract observations uh, from 1935. So the Singer Tract was in Northeast Louisiana where they uh, viewed them. So despite, again, this is, uh, the, the narrative is the ivory bills would be easy to find. Uh, but the experts who had actual dealings with the ivory bill, um, well, let me say this right off the bat. There are two notable exceptions to about what I'm about to say. Tanner himself in his book uh, implies that the ivory bills and the singer tract weren't that difficult to find. Um, and Roger Torrey Peterson wrote that he and Bayard Christie in, in 1942 were in the singer tract. And even though it took them it did take him a day and a half to find the birds. Uh, he said they were easy to follow because you could hear them. Uh, they were noisy through the woods. However, the birds in the singer track were actually protected. And uh, while we can't be sure that there was absolute uh, prohibition, well, there was there was a prohibition on hunting in the singer track. It was a game preserve. Now, whether or not it was always enforced, I don't know. But uh, Chris Haney, who was our first speaker, argues, I think, very trenchantly that the, uh, the birds in the singer tract were unusual and they were habituated to humans. But back to Allen and Kellogg, um, <coughs> Dr. Allen wrote, they're no not noisy except when disturbed. Their voice doesn't carry as far as the pileated woodpeckers. And I'm not gonna read through all of it because I think y'all can, but the, they camped for five days and they seldom heard the birds. And it took them three days, even though they knew that the birds were in those woods in the singer track. We had hunted for three days for this particular pair of birds without ever hearing them, even though we were frequently within 300 yards of the nest, which we finally found because we happened to be within hearing distance when the birds changed places on the nest. Uh, similarly, this is a, a letter from December 23, 1936, from, <clears throat> excuse me, Herbert Stoddard. Herbert Stoddard and Alex Sprunt probably had the most experience with ivory bills in at least in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, Herbert Stoddard in particular uh, as a child in Florida. So he talks about basically, this letter was generated because Dr. Allen sent out letters um, to experts who, who then wrote to Jim Tanner, student of Dr. Allen, who's about to embark. Uh, he was gifted with a an Audubon, uh, project, they paid for him to do a census of the ivory bills in the, south, in the southeastern United States. So this letter was written from Herbert Stoddard to Jim Tanner on no, December 23, 1936, as Jim Tanner was about to set out what essentially would be a two-year uh, study of the birds of the ivory bills. Again, Dr. Uh, Tanner, um, he later becomes Dr. Tanner, he only found ivory bills in the singer track where J.J. Kuhn, my hero, had led the Cornell expedition to find the birds. But it's important to note that Dr. <clears throat> excuse me, Herbert Stoddard says that basically that there's a much vaster range of the ivory bills than thought about. But here's what I really want to drill down on. I can best answer your question of possibilities by saying if I had the rest of my life for the purpose, I doubt that I could cover adequately half the ground I now think worth investigating. And here's the kicker. When I say adequately, I have in mind five days I've spent personally looking, especially for these birds with such men as Bob Allen and Alex Brunt, who again were experts, on an area of some 10,000 acres known to be frequented by several pairs of these birds without seeing one. And this similarly, George Lowry, my hero and, and I rebuild mentor who wrote this as a 
20 year or 20 year old and announcing the ivory bills and the singer tract and this is presented to the aou union in chicago october 1934. <clears throat> i know of other attempts where dr lowry tried to find the bird after the the ivory bills and the singer track after the 1932 declaration that uh mason spencer had killed one so at any rate it just Again, Dr. Lowry writing, my first attempt to locate the birds was in June 1933 when in the company of John Campbell, an entire week was spent in the heart of the big woods. Um, they didn't find them. Again, fantastic ornithologists in woods where they knew ivory bills were there, yet went a whole week without finding them. Mike Collins, I referred to frequently, and uh, again, I see we have a few new people, so I'll repeat that. <clears throat> please look at Mike's work on fishcrow.com. And Mike, again, I won't go through all this, and please look through the list and you ask me about that. But I did want to start with the first thing. Mike's done a lot of mathematical uh, analyses and concluded the expected waiting time for clear photos is mil of ivory bills is millions of times greater than other baseline species. And Honestly, I never see anyone challenge Mike Collins in his expertise of math, and uh, I don't blame them because he is an expert. He's got his uh, undergrad from MIT in math and his PhD from Northwestern in math, and he's a leading expert on mathematical issues with underwater bioacoustics. So I think Mike's uh, work is very compelling and shows that the ivory bill has persisted, but as to this particular thing, Mike's, again, look up his work. He's done great work to show how difficult it would be to photograph an ivory bill. So that's just setting up the problem. Here's, here's our, our advice on how to find an ivory bill. And before I get too deeply into this, as I said before, uh, the ivory bill is an enigma. Uh, so there are so many things that I've had to, un after studying the bird for 50 years, there are so many things that I thought I knew that I've had to unlearn. So, and, and I'm going to tell you that, and I've described the bird as being very uh, shy and elusive, but honestly, the first time I saw the bird, <laughs> I was yakking up a storm and the bird flew to within 14 yards of me. So uh, I'm just trying to give you the data. I still think we're going with the supposition that as everyone who wrote about it said that, that they were very shy. But so back to, here's a broad view of, the first thing that I really want to emphasize is we need so it's essentially you can put yourself in a position to be lucky. And I have been very uh, diligent in being in the woods and I have gotten lucky and I think I've gotten more skillful. But the point is uh, we don't control what the bird does. So our first attack, uh, our first strategy is to get public engagement. And we'll go through this a little but. The ivory bill is not a difficult bird to identify uh, once you get a few of the field marks. And so in engaging people, we really want to uh, educate outdoors people. And I said humans with broad views. And what I mean is it, if an ivory bill flies deep in the woods and there's no one there to see it, does the ivory bill exist? <laughs> so the point is you have to have not only an ivory bill, but an ivory bill in a condition where it will be seen. So that's how I say humans with broad views. And that would be people working on pipelines and even better, people working on barges on say the Atchafalaya or the Mississippi where there are long, broad uh, vistas. So we're trying to get the information in those people's hands. And we've done that with, we have a reward poster and we've given talks and you, you'd be surprised I have on our van where I can put my kayak in, I, I have Ivory Bill Woodpecker stickers. And I've had three, different times where people gave me very credible reports of ivory bills when they saw my van and the sticker. So it's important to be here. So Lauren and I are in the, what I consider to be the heart of ivory bill country here in Northeast Louisiana. Uh, and we take advantage of that. So that's the, the public part. And again, we have zero ownership of the ivory bill. We're happy to help, help anybody uh, and give them any information we've learned. Uh, I've been blessed to see the ivory bill two and a half times. <laughs> the reason I say that, two times I've, I've seen it certainly. And a third time, uh, I, I, if you put a gun to my head, I would say it was an ivory bill, but I couldn't see its head. So I can't really conclude that. But I've been very lucky uh, to do that. And again, I, I've done the work. 
but we'd be thrilled for anybody to uh, find the ivory bill and get proof of its uh, persistence, which uh, while I, I'm not going to belabor the point, I think both Guy Luno and Mike Collins have uh, produced uh, photographic video uh, evidence of the ivory bill's persistence. Uh, we, our real hope is just to, to get everybody look, as many people looking at it as possible. So that's the public part. Now, what we've done, <clears throat> and all our own dime, that's uh, something that's, you know, people hurl at me that, oh, we're spending money on ivory bills when we should be spending money on something else. I, well, when people say that to me, I, so one guy said we could, should be studying Backman Sparrows. I said, if you want to spend your own money and start a Backman Sparrow, uh, just uh, group, I'd be your biggest contributor. But as I say, this has been all our own dime. Uh, that we are going to start asking uh, for financial help because uh, this is a big project. But so far, uh, we've done an aerial survey of uh, the whole state looking for clusters of dead trees and large bottomland tracks. Our efforts are almost exclusively to find an active cavity. Uh, there's not <laughs> been an acceptable, widely acceptable photo of an ivory bill without having first found an active cavity. And, and all I mean by that is woodpeckers nest in cavities and trees. And so we're, we wanna find a cavity that has an ivory bill spending the night in it, or even better, an ivory bill nest in a cavity. So we've done the aerial surveys. We've, we've isolated a few places that we will, we will start organizing searches in from that. Uh, and then once with the aerial survey, we follow up by kayak, foot, or horse, and up in the parents. I'd really love to maybe have observation balloons, and Mike Collins has done a lot of work with drones, but I worry that the sound of the drone might be uh, a, 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 de a problem for, you know, scaring. I hate to be a, have a drone video of an ivory bill flying over the horizon, never to be seen again. So that, that's a concern. And there's a great guy in Lafayette I've talked to about paragliders. Obviously that might make too much noise too. So that's our survey generally. Once we found an area that we like or have, have heard birds in there, I'm gonna argue for uh, morning listening posts. We'll talk a little more about that. Uh, how far the, the birds sounds travel uh, generally, you find a rule of thumb, a quarter mile, but all of that varies so much with uh, ambient temperature, humidity, whether the leaves are out, wind, and obviously the uh, woodpeckers, and the ivory bill in particular, make two types of noise. One is a call, which I, there are lots of different ways of saying what the ivory bill sounds like, but I think Kent, K-E-N-T, is, is what we'll just call it for now. So there's the Kent call. And they had other types of calls, <clears throat> one of which was like a, a flicker, but there's a call and then there's what's called the double knock. The ivory bill is the only American representative of the Campephalus genus, which is mostly, a, which is an otherwise Latin American bird species, uh, genus. But Campephalus, uh, rather than drumming like other American woodpeckers, they just have either double knock, like bam, bam, or a single knock. So that carries longer. But back to our theory, we want to have people spaced out a quarter mile apart. And people are the best listening posts because we're omnidirectional. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll talk about later in, in the talk about how the, the plan came together. And then at the end, we'll talk about equipment. So I said public engagement, and we've mentioned Dean Herleman before. And it's not just hunting groups or uh, birding groups that we talk to. We really want to engage children. And that's our larger purpose, Lauren and I really are in this to get children in particular interested in nature studies. So uh, a few of us have mentioned how much we're beholden to Dean Herleman, who was associated with the uh, Aldo Leopold Landscape Alliance in Burlington, Iowa, which is uh, Aldo Leopold's hometown. So these are all great carvings that Dean Herleman made um, holding the ivory bill and the, there's a great auk and um, it's so nice just to illustrate to the kids. You'll see next to the great auk is the world's smallest hummingbird, the bee hummingbird. So anyway, we're trying to engage children in this, and this gets to their their parents too. So we've really uh, we really that's aside from being in the woods, that's probably the most fun is going to schools. Uh, one of the things way we ways we generated interest, and frankly, it's been a little surprise to me, is we've offered a twelve thousand dollar reward for anybody who leads us to a cavity. Uh, 
And I just, we'll get to it later, but Tiger Droppings, I'm always wearing my LSU hat. Uh, Tiger Droppings is the fan uh, website for LSU athletics, but it also has an outdoor board, which we'll refer to later. And I was surprised to find <laughs> we were, we're in the Wikipedia entry for the Ivory Bill for this reward. So the reward generates, I, I get, we probably get four or five calls a week about it. And I would say among that, six, you can't exclude Ivory Bill Woodpecker. So, and I'm following up on one uh, Wednesday morning on this, but it's gotten a lot of news um, and uh, we'd love to pay it out. So I did, I mentioned that the Ivory Bill is easy to identify. So one of the things is, at least as the recordings, uh, people say, oh, you, uh, you can't distinguish that from a Blue Jay or uh, <laughs> that you can't distinguish an Ivory Bill call. I've, if you read all the literature, none of the people who observed ivory bills, none of them said, gee, I, I didn't know exactly what that was, and it turned out to be an ivory bill. I, in the field, all I can tell you is the ivory bill really stood out. Um, and the first time I heard it was on March 11, and uh, the hair on my arm went up just because I knew that what I was hearing was not anything I'd ever heard. And then the rest of my analytical brain cooked in, I realized it's an ivory bill. Uh, and the other thing I liked about the first time I heard it is uh, <clears throat> I had this image of Louis Armstrong where he's making, he's blowing his cheeks up. Like it's, it was a forceful sound and it really did make me think of a trumpet. And I've been lucky to have been in the, one of the, the confusion sounds that people say is the uh, Blue Jay makes a Kent call also. And I, I've heard that and I've been lucky to be in the field with a trained opera singer, Patricia Johnson, when we heard both an Ivory Bill Kent and a Blue Jay Kent. And I was, uh, so lucky that I asked Patricia to your trained ear, how would you define the difference between those two sounds? And she said, oh, that's easy. The ivory bill is a powerful sound. It's sonorous, S-O-N-O-R-O-U-S. And the, the blue jay is frayed, F-R-A-Y-E-D. I thought that was such a great description. And it's true. When I hear a blue jay, so when I hear the ivory bill, it sounds like this. It's forceful. Uh, and again, it sounds like it's being exploded through the bill. But the Blue Jay to me sounds like someone just making uh, smoke rings. It's a, it's a soft call that's in the field. Uh, it, but again, the important thing is that uh, no one describes who's, who's heard the ivory bills, uh, describes it as being a difficult call to identify. And that was my experience. Yeah, and so here we'll play. This is the this is a gold standard. It's the 1935 recording from Cornell and the Macaulay Lab. Cornell, anything birds go to Cornell. They do a fantastic job. I do want to say before Lauren starts that, that this is Ivory Bill's recorded at the nest, and there was nothing between uh, basically the recording uh, apparatus and the birds. So unlike ours, yeah, and, and also. I, and so what I'm going to say, we'll play ours in a second, uh, just to show you that, that you that it sounds like an ivory bill. But um, again, I keep in mind that these are going to sound slightly different because of, of the circumstances. And I've, I don't know uh, whether or not these sound, the Cornell recordings were compressed. I've read something that made me think they were. And by that, I just mean that they put the sounds together. But with that, Listen to the, here's the 1935 recording of the nest in the singer track, Northeast Louisiana. The banging on the wood that you hear is not a double knock. That's just foraging, right? It, the, any woodpecker would, would make that sound as it's uh, foraging or, or working on the cavity, uh, you know, making little, little carpentry work. So this was, so this was, uh, again, I heard the bird on March 11 with two other guys. And then March 15, 2017, we got it. Another guy and I got in uh, before, well before first light, I think we got it. You know, we started walking about 3.30. So here's our 
recordings, just snippets from the, we had three hours of recordings. Yeah. Huh. This is, yeah. And I think that the ivory bill kicks in about uh, 10, 10 seconds or so. Thank you. And in the field, it sounded like it was coming from three different birds. And we never saw the birds. They were across a creek and in, in deep woods. Uh, and here's the, the other recording, a snippet from the, uh, three hours of recordings on that day. I think that we counted there were like 70 Kent calls within the three hours. Diary Bill gets described as sounding like a, a nuthatch. Trust in the field that you would never confuse this for a nuthatch. And again, I'm not I'm not an expert on uh, sonograms, and I don't really want to spend too much time on it. So I don't know if someone comes up with a sonogram that makes that sound that to to be a blue jay or a a nuthatch. Uh, more power to them. But I was lucky on March 10, 2019 to hear that exact same sound coming from two birds. And <clears throat> then I walked towards the sound and those two birds, I, I saw two ivory bills who were exiting the area and, and then I didn't hear the sound anymore. So while I can't say that I saw those birds calling, uh, I can say that it was exactly the sound that I've, I've recorded and I'm certain it was associated with those two ivory bills, but of course that kind of buries the lead. I saw a pair of ivory bills on March 10, 2019, but uh, any doubts I had as to whether or not we recorded ivory bills in 2017, and I got one Kent call in 2018, uh, was totally evaporated on uh, <clears throat> March 10 of 2019. I had some questions. Uh, I was recording with a, a Zoom, I, I'll take a photo of it. Oh, uh, Judy asked if officials received this. Uh, I know that March and Lamertink uh, has reviewed it and thought it was an ivory bill. I mean, that a third party told me that. Uh, actually, the so th this is a good question that Judy asked. Um, the Louisiana Bird Records Committee, they will not accept an ivory bill, uh, accept something as an ivory bill woodpecker unless there is a photograph and multiple uh, observers. So I haven't submitted that to them. I'm, I'm happy to, you know, share it with anybody, but I don't really, I haven't really gone through the process because it's a, from, from my reading of it, it's a, it's a futile attempt. I definitely will be submitting this to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service though. And just briefly, we've gone through this, but just to show how the ivory bill, uh, superficially, it looks like the pileated, uh, and why won't, what, take the time, but if, if you haven't seen the two videos I presented last time to show the Imperial Woodpecker and its flight pattern versus the Pileated, they really are quite distinctive uh, in the way they fly. Uh, but the, for the, to separate the ivory bill and the only other really big woodpecker we have, the Pileated, when they're flying, it's the trailing edge of the wing, both on the upper wing and, and under wing uh, is white. And so when I saw the, my first sighting, uh, I didn't hear the bird coming. Uh, so I had, as I've described, sort of a limbic, L-I-M-B-I-C <laughs> sighting. And it was quite emotional event. The second sighting, though, was uh, it was just an ordinary bird watching thing where I'd heard, heard the, the sounds that I knew was were ivory bills. And then I saw the two ivory bills uh, and it's on my life list. But I just, this is great work by David Sibley that was put out by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. So while I'm critical of fish and wildlife, uh, the 
proposal to declare the bird extinct. I'm wildly impressed with them and they did a great job with this. Um, yeah, and then we'll move on to, and many people have seen this, but I just wanted to show the comparisons of the ivory bill. This was our friends at the Carnegie uh, Museum in Pittsburgh. Did a, uh, they were super generous with us and let me uh, prepare a drawer of common Louisiana woodpeckers absent the red cockaded, but just to show the differences in size. Um, so you'll see the downy woodpecker is below, on the right, the downy wood, woodpecker is below the ivory bill, uh, and the downy would fit in the tail of the ivory bill. And on the left is a comparison of the pileated and the ivory bill. And while the ivory bill's dimensions aren't that much longer, typically the ivory bill is described as 21 inches in length and 30 inches <clears throat> in wingspan, and the pileated is just slightly smaller at usually 19 inches, and I think 28 inches on the wingspan. But the ivory bill is, is much heftier than the pileated. Uh, and then looking back on the right, you'll see the red-headed wood, woodpecker in the bottom right. It has the same pattern on the back, which is, of course, the folded wings, but the bird itself is half the size of the ivory bill. But I will say this, in the big woods where big trees where we've seen ivory bills, uh, scale is hard to find. So, um, so again, you know, obviously, if you had an ivory bill and a redheaded next to each other, you could just see the back, you, you'd know the size difference. But uh, uh, that is a caution with the looking in the big trees. Uh, and I've mentioned this before, but again, just if we have anybody new, <clears throat> I don't think a competent observer would confuse an ivory bill woodpecker for a pileated woodpecker. However, if you just got a brief look at the bird flying, uh, again, the ivory bill is described as flying like a pintail, that is like a duck. The black-bellied whistling duck on the left flies like a duck. <laughs> and uh, if you just see an explosion as it's getting an escape flight, even though the back of the, the wing, uh, the trailing edge on the black-bellied whistling duck is black, it's not white like the ivory bill, that might be pretty hard to see in a split second thing. So whenever we get reports of anybody, particularly experienced hunters, I make sure that they know what a, a black bellied whistling duck looks like. Uh, and uh, we've, we've come across a few instances where in fact, that's what they were saying. Now, I, well, I love pileated woodpeckers too, but I love black bellied <laughs> whistling duck. So, and it's a fairly new, in North Louisiana, it's a fairly new addition to our uh, avia fauna. So. Uh, and then, as I said, if it's not flying, if you see it perched, well, then there's really the, the only thing you can confuse it for would be the red-headed woodpecker. So the odds are a long way of saying that it's not difficult to train people to tell the difference between an ivory bill and, and uh, other birds. Uh, so it's not really a function of ornithology. Again, I think it's more a function of getting people in the field and some logistical things. And if we had forever, I'd talk about the engineering aspects. Uh, but again, I, I think you can fairly easily train people to separate an ivory bill woodpecker from other birds. Back to what we've done, this is my good friend, <clears throat> Kelly, <coughs> excuse me, Slovant Sl Sorrels. And I feel a little guilty uh, in that much of the aerial survey was done in Kelly's Cirrus pictured behind us. And the Cirrus uh, cruises at over 200 knots and it's air conditioned. <laughs> so I'm a commercial pilot, but I've flown mostly beat up planes and none of which had air conditioning. So, but through with Kelly, we were able to get, you know, around most of the state. Um, I'm trying to think maybe the very lower Chafalaya, we still need to survey, but uh, <clears throat> we've covered the area quite uh, adequately. Uh, and I say with the theorists, it was great. <laughs> So once we, uh, I would put pinpoints where, you know, things that look good from the air, uh, and then I'd follow up either by kayak or horse or, uh, or walking. Uh, kayaking, I am not, honestly, I didn't kayak until I think maybe three, four years ago. Uh, it is, I so recommend it for any kind of wildlife view. And here in Louisiana, it just completely expands our ability to uh, get, get places that are that are tough to uh even with with motorized uh water vessels um so one of the great things is mentioned in the awk article the recent observations of the ivory bill woodpecker from 1937 dr allen who's the principal author of that says that in describing how difficult it is to see ivory bills sometimes he said that once 
he was uh, catching chips from an ivory built woodpecker who was up in a tree and because of the foliage, he couldn't see the ivory bill. So he, he, that was his example. Here, I'm in the flooded swamp, uh, flooded swamp woods of Darbonne National Wildlife Refuge near our home in Monroe. And those chips were made by, I knew it was a pileated because I'd seen the bird fly into the top of a, a large tree. Uh, and those chips had just been knocked down by the pileated. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more in, in training uh, later in the year, but kayaking really is, is a fantastic way to go. And Jeff Hill's book, The Ivoryville Hunters, goes into that and explains the benefits of kayaking too. But I'm a real proponent of kayaks as, as a way to go, particularly around in North Louisiana. Well, in many parts of Louisiana, we have Palmetto and then lots of places in the Southeast, but it's very hard to move stealthily through the woods. So it's just a wonderful thing in a flooded, flooded woods on a calm morning you can hear forever. So one of the things we're that's kind of controversial is we've been training canines to smell for ivory bill. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is one of my favorite uh, times with the ivory bill. One of the, the best places we've found is Sabine Island Wildlife Management Area and all the area around Sabine uh, is I think not it hasn't been searched very much for ivory bills. So I met one of the local people who uh, helped me with <laughs> his dog. Uh, this, this man, again, gave very, uh, Mr. Gidry's owner, gave very credible uh, sighting reports of uh, a big woodpecker with a white bill and, and all of that. But so the fun part is I walked about eight miles through those woods. Uh, Mr. Gidry would keep coming back to me. <laughs> Just, it was so much fun I had to put him in there. Oh, here's the crux of our, uh, once we're down and searching, uh, the really, really, really important thing is to be on site uh, early in the morning before uh, the birds are stirring. Uh, and that, I, I alluded to that before uh, in that <clears throat> it's hard to move through the woods stealthily where we are. And, and I've gotten better at it, but uh, we'll go into that a little more. But um, one of the great advances we have are the nav apps uh, so that you can navigate pretty well through the woods. Uh, the biggest pain in the neck for me are uh, in the, the some time of the year, the spider webs are pretty tough. Uh, Jim Tanner, whom I referred to, he is a student uh, of uh, Dr. Allen. This is in the 1935 expedition into the um, Singer Track. And again, this is his great book uh, on the right. Uh, but I wanted to say where this is where our search strategy comes from. And Dr. Tanner, uh, again, this, he, was, he was 23 probably when this book was published, but uh, James Tanner wrote of the ivory bill. Uh, and further up on the page, he, he says that the ivory bill, excuse me, was relative to the other birds, a late riser. But here's the thing that's important for our search. Um, he described, after a minute or so, once it came out of its roost in the morning, it would call then more, would call once, then more, single kents. Frequently, its mate would answer, and then one bird would fly to and join the other. If there were young of the year present, all birds would get together soon after leaving their uh, roost holes. So that's our whole theory of the case, is we want to hear that, that golden uh, first call of the morning, and even better if the mate uh, responded. And I've watched uh, social woodpeckers, particularly redheaded woodpeckers, this is exactly how they behave. Actually, all the woodpeckers, the pileated do this too. Uh, so it's a great way to find them. So that's our theory of the case is we want to hear that first call, first thing in the morning. And honestly, uh, the <clears throat> frustration, I'm so much better now. And I, I would be interested in people who've had sightings or interactions with the ivory bill once you have it, you think, oh, well, this is easy. We'll, we'll be able to find the bird right away. So I'm ashamed to say that on the, in the March 15 of 2017 recordings, which were, they started right at daylight. Uh, I, the next morning, my, my friend, and I didn't have the nav app then, my friend couldn't stay for that day. And so I had to get in on my own navigation. So I was, I got there probably uh, 40 minutes after first light and didn't hear the birds that we'd heard the previous morning. Um, so 
Uh, that's one of the, that's one of my regrets. I wish I'd known then what I know now. But here's our, our theory is, is we want to have a chain of human listening posts. So again, in that golden hour, you, and um, I'm, I'm sure I've told this before, but it's somewhat, um, we're using a quarter mile to be a quarter mile apart. And you probably could get away with being a half mile apart and still be sure to hear the birds in between you. But uh, we want to be extra cautious. So uh, we'll put people in a line and as many people as possible at every quarter mile. Uh, and it would be, it'd be nice if we could do uh, a crosshatch pattern, but if we could just do it one way and then we'd move it probably for the next morning. And then again, it's very critical to be out there and quiet before dawn <laughs> again because the, you don't want to make much much noise and you just want to sit there and you just listen for 90 minutes after dawn and so even though jim tanner described the ivory bills a late riser uh certainly uh, an hour and a half after dawn the birds would definitely have gotten up and one of the things he observed is on a cloud and i've seen this with other woodpeckers on cloudy days they got up later uh and after that 90 minute period we want to make as <clears throat> excuse me a small a footprint in the woods as possible. And there are ways, and we'll, we'll, this is such a, a detailed discussion, I'll go into it later, I mean, at, at another time. But there are ways you can you can walk fairly quietly, but uh, you're still, you're gonna make noise. One of the things that was very important, I think, is to not talk. Um, so one of, the, one of the benefits of searching alone is there's no one to talk to. And I remember one day, it was, I think it was 96 degrees, I was out in Tinsaw River National Wildlife Refuge. I spent the whole day out there and I didn't say I, there was no one to talk to. So as I, just as I was walking back to the truck, I don't know, oh, I know what it was. I saw something and I exclaimed, I said, man, that's really pretty. I don't know who I was talking to. And the whole woods lit up and <laughs> all the animals would run away. Anyhow, don't talk. And it, it's all towards leading towards uh, finding an active cavity. And so within that, uh, you just want to take the, uh, a midday siesta because if you see a bird at one o'clock, uh, again, maybe you'll get really lucky and get a photograph. I doubt it, but it's not going to give you any, any information as to where the bird is roosting. So to save energy, and it's not just energy, you really need. So for instance, in 2018, my one recording, the bird calls for maybe three seconds. So you have to be attentive the whole time. So uh, I think it's very important to uh, take a break during the day. Uh, and again, it, it, the theory is the same to hear them as they're going in. Now, I don't, I haven't found anything in the literature that says the ivory bills always made a sound before they go into their roosting cavity for the night. <clears throat> but the one recording I made in 2018 was a few minutes after sun, uh, sunset, uh, and before dusk. So, uh, and again, I, I didn't have the wherewithal. To I should have been there first thing in the morning the next day, but I wasn't. And what I was saying about you don't want to make too much noise in the woods. I'm really influenced by tracking. Um, and the one on the right, Tom Brown, is sort of the Bible for tracking. But John Young uh, has applied that. And I highly recommend this book, What the Robin Knows. So essentially, even though, let's say you're walking through the woods, <clears throat> and there's not an ivory, there's an ivory bill a mile away. The ivory bill would, well, pro probably could hear you from a mile, but it's not, it's not your noise directly. It's the bow wave of animals that you're pushing through the woods. So that's why uh, we're big proponents of if you, the observation should just be made in the morning and, uh, and again, maybe light scouting for cavities thereafter. So this is what we're looking for. Uh, this is, a recent cavity we found and it looks like the Cornell 1935 cavity which I had photos of I was so thrilled that when I visited Ithaca a couple times they they showed me the uh the, they have the cavity in a drawer uh, and this is uh the the cavity photos I have from Cornell it looks like a, and this is from Cornell on the left it looks like a pig snout and uh so that's the, that is literally, you know, the, the, the photo that I took of the finger tract 1935 one. And then here's a, a cavity in Louisiana we found. The, it was really exciting because the scaling around it and that sort of pig snout aspect was the same. So here's a cavity stakeout. 
<laughs> in the afternoon, it's great. You can just, you know, you, you plop down and, and you try to, and the important thing is you don't move at all. Uh, sometimes, you know, tough with mosquitoes, but you learn to suck it up. Uh, and these are just scaling. Um, <clears throat> I, frankly, I think it's, I don't think we know enough about, here's what I'll say about scaling. So the eye reveal definitely is described by Jim Tanner and every, everyone else that observed them would scale the bark of the tree to get the beetle larvae that were underneath. Uh, the question is, can you look at scaling and know it's an eye rebuild to the exclusion of everything else? Uh, Jeff Hill had a really good discussion about, he'd come up with a way of measuring bark adherence, which I haven't. All I can go is on tree species. So if it's a, a tree that has particularly adherent bark, such as a hickory or a pecan, pecan, and it's living, and I see scaling on it, I get excited because morphologically, the ivory bill has a lo much longer neck than the pileated. And so you have A, the neck, and B, the chisel-like bill. Uh, the length of the neck is important, just why if you had a longer whip, you could make a, uh, a stronger motion. The ivory bill, because of the extra long neck, can uh, exert a lot more force than it has that bill. So theoretically, uh, tightly adhering bark on a living tree that's knocked off, uh, I, I'm not prepared to say it could only be an ivory bill, but uh, it gets us excited when we see it. And this is one of those typical cavities. And now, again, I've looked for the pattern. I can't find it for sure. I've seen all the photos that I know, that I know of, of ivory bill cavities. Uh, all we can really say is the cavity on the right is big enough to be an, uh, a pileated or an ivory bill. I've looked at, uh, I've scouted uh, 43 cavities, 26 of which I'm proud to say turned out to be active. Uh, they were all pileated. So here's something that really, you know, one of the questions is, well, how does the ivory bill find uh, the food? And uh, surprisingly, the beetle larvae, who are soft animals, they make a great noise. This is Sweet beetle larvae. for any ivory bill hunter. That's beetle larvae munching in a downed pine. So you see, one of the questions I have in searching is, do you have forcing behavior? Meaning, are you trying to get the ivory bill to, to make a sound? One of the things I've thought about, and I, you know, I'm working with scientists about this, is whether or not to broadcast that same sound we just heard for, uh, for ivory bills. Uh, and I don't know that it would be ivory bill specific, but um, again, I, an ivory bill would look at that pine and probably go, yeah, I can get in that, whereas a, a downy wouldn't try. Uh, the other thing is beetle pheromone, and we're exper we're looking into that, whether or not you could <clears throat> have the ex extract and put it on trees in hopes of bringing it. Um, the MAWO, just a reminder for me to talk about the Magellanic woodpecker, and John Williams will talk about uh, this later in the year. Uh, he had some theories about the Magellanic, but uh, prior to meeting John, I was so lucky to meet <clears throat> a woman named uh, Amy, who's it was at North Texas. I literally was at Cornell and had a copy of the Ivory Bill uh, recovery plan on my lap as I was waiting for a meeting. And this woman walked by and I said, sure, I was left, but she saw the Ivory Bill. And I said, uh, are you familiar with the Ivory Bill? And she said, Oh, yeah. I said, uh, well, how's that? And she said, I'm doing my dissertation on the Magellanic woodpecker of Chile. And the importance of that was, I'm not kidding you, just prior to Amy walking by, I had the thought that, you know, there's so little we really know about the ivory bill. We need to study its closest relative. And in many ways, the Magellanic it might be the closest relative because unlike all other Campepolis, it lives in a semi-temperate zone. So it lives in far south. South America, just as our ivory bill lives, you know, not in the jungles. So I thought the Magellanic would be an interesting bird to study. And then literally Amy walked by. Uh, the point of the story is I asked Amy, what kind of sounds in attracting Magellanics did you, did you make in your study? And she said that the call that they used most effectively was the alarm call. And I have to say, I don't really have the courage to do that because I, I know I know what Amy's saying, but theoretically, again, I'd hate to uh, have a call and that frighten away the ivory bill. The other thing that, that Amy said that worked, and this is the thing that John Williams has been working on, and, I, and I've tried it myself, is to do a Magellanic uh, nestling begging. 
And I've played that in the ivory bill woods, <clears throat> not had any responses from ivory bills. But I tell you what's, what's amazing is you get immediate responses from barred owls. So I don't know enough to say that the Magellanic nestling sounds a lot different from other birds. So, so uh, we'll say this, it gets a response from the predators. So attraction technique. This is a bit crude, but we're thinking of using something like this, but we're not sure that the ivory bills can uh, read. <laughs> That's that. We just, anytime I can put a uh, far side Gary Larson in, I'm going to do that. Uh, but on a serious note, so our friends at Cornell, March and Lamartine, uh, who's a Dutch ornithologist with Cornell, considered the world's expert on woodpeckers. <clears throat> he came up with this double uh, knock box. So again, Campephilus uh, genus does a double knock, and this is the pale-billed woodpecker. I believe this was in Costa Rica. But again, this, Cornell did this, and, and it's worth watching. Uh, so, uh, maybe a track of Campephilus woodpeckers. We know they're here. Right. Let's hope they're hanging out in the vicinity. Marching's on the left and, and banging right now. It's not always the double knock you hear first. Sometimes you just hear them fly. Occasionally they'll come in close and they won't double knock at all. There you go. That's it for sure. We can hear some light tapping. Superficially the bird, yeah, Which usually means it's looking for good resonance. Seeing a pale-billed woodpecker is something I never take for granted. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal bird to look at. For a pale-billed woodpecker, that bill, that powerful ice cream cone for a bill, that's their first survival tool. It really is the means to their survival in this forest. and. Everything from their feeding to where they sleep at night to where they raise their young depends on that powerful bill. Wow, that was cool. That was wild, <laughs> for sure. Wow. Good session. Wow. And having a conversation with a bell bill. Totally. Bird, that's so cool. <laughs> it's not often you get to talk territory with a bird. <laughs> So a couple of things as that applies to the ivory bill. First, the literature suggests that the ivory bill uh, is not territorial. So we're not really sure about this. Um, <clears throat> as I I've, hope I've, I've, I've made clear, I'm just really good at identifying birds. I am not a, the last ornithology class I took was when I was eight years old in 1969. So I'll defer to others about this. And in particular, I certainly would, you know, trust Martin's, um, judgment about this, but I'm just, I'm a little, I'm leery that if you do a double knock, maybe a young male ivory bill would hear that and think, oh, well, in my case, there's a 230 pound ivory bill <laughs> making noise and would flee the area. So I will say this, the first time I did a double knock and I did it with two by fours, uh, we got responses. Uh, and that's the only time I've had responses. Uh, uh, so my guess as with those birds is I was certainly not fooling that ivory bill that, uh, that he thought I was an ivory bill. I think the double knock was a way of him probably communicating with his family members, or it might have just been an ivory bill's way to say, what the heck? Uh, so I did want to emphasize our search is a year-round search, and there are benefits from each season. Most people really concentrate on the breeding season to search, which of course makes sense because we want to find a nest. But uh, I think like all uh, animals, uh, ivory bills probably become a lot more secretive once they're on the nest. So that's difficult. So we've really searched a lot in the summer. There's some downsides to that. 
uh, chief of which is that there's obviously canopy leaf out. So it's hard to see through the woods. But uh, one of the benefits of the summer, and we haven't, I heard an ivory bill in July of 2019, but I haven't seen an ivory bill in the summer. Uh, but I'm somewhat hopeful because of the following. Um, I think the young birds might not, not be as skilled at staying hidden. And second, the parent birds will be somewhat stressed and paying attention to raising their birds. Um, and so they'll be easier to see. And a proof of concept in the woods where we've seen the ivory bills, where I, I've been in July and August, the woodpeckers, even with canopy leaf out, are more visible because they are feeding their young. And I've gotten to get much closer to pileated woodpeckers. And in fact, it was kind of exciting because my hero, George Lowry, described uh, catching ivory bill, a woodpecker, ivory bill woodpecker making uh, strips from a tree, uh, much like Dr. Allen described. And so I was able to do it with the pileated. So again, the point of the story is uh, we are a uh, year round search. Uh, and uh, again, I, I'm concerned that if you search just during the breeding season, the birds are a lot more quiet. So there are some downsides to searching during hot weather, the, the spider webs, and there are lots of snakes. These, some of them are friendly, some are not, uh, but it's not that, that bad. Um, this is something we've used, automated recording units. Um, we're not really gonna, I don't really view ARUs as proof of anything only because uh, in terms of moving the needle, I don't, I'm not sure that audio alone could do it, but they're very useful in triangulating where the bird uh, might be. So again, if you had, I don't know, a dozen ARUs in a certain point uh, and you heard the same sound because the same sound at uh, the same time with three different ones, you could draw lines from that and triangulate the location. So again, theoretically, it could work that way. So when a plan comes together, I just wanted to sort of sum up so again, as I said, we're really public about this. And um, one of the things I gave a talk at Black at uh, Red River National Wildlife Refuge near Shreveport and the NPR station covered it. And uh, again, I, honestly, I was naive about this. It led the article with, you know, uh, Louisiana and offers $12,000 for Ivoryville Woodpecker. So a long time, I'm not, as you might be able to tell, I'm not very good with uh, internet and, and such. So, so I, I was looking, because they did a really good job of reproducing our recordings, uh, the NPR station in Shreveport. So I was looking up uh, Red River Radio was their name. So I Googled Red River Radio. I was looking for this uh, article. And the first thing that came up to my shock was, again, I'm a big LSU fan, is Tiger Droppings. And so tigerdroppings.com, I didn't know they had an outdoor board, as I mentioned. So what happened was someone had picked up the NPR article and put it on the outdoor board at Tiger Droppings. So I didn't see this until I think it was at least 12 pages of dialogue. And so I didn't see it until about the fifth page. And I'm not surprisingly, my pseudonym is Ivory Bill Matt. So <laughs> I came in and introduced myself and just said, hey, we're the ones offering the reward. You happen to answer any questions. And it was a really good snapshot of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a group of Louisiana, <laughs> out, as far as I can tell, mostly men, I was going to say out, outdoors people, but, but mostly hunters. Um, and I would say yeah, probably 10 to 15 percent were really hostile to the ivory deal, the idea that the ivory bill could still exist. And I would say a good 25 percent either knew somebody had seen an ivory bill or they themselves had seen an ivory bill. And then there was the, the great middle. And so it was so worth just telling the quick story is my biggest detractor. And I'm going to call him Joe. Joe said, basically, you're either incompetent, crazy or lying. And so I said to Joe, well, I don't really cotton to being called any of those things. But and so we had a back and forth and I was, as sweet as you can see in there here, what I, I said is uh, uh, really, I just wanted to announce our search. And uh, um, anyhow, I, I try to be, I always try to be as neutral as possible because I'm not really, I don't want to run anybody off. I just, if they're interested, come anyhow, the point of the story is uh, my biggest detractor <coughs> um, 
later, I think in this thread, said, did anybody know what this call is? And it was a pie build green, but it's a pretty abstruse call. And it's a pretty obscure call. And lots of people guessed and I was letting them, you know, guess and guess. And then I, I sent him a link to the pie build green. And he said, oh my God, that was it. So I guess it's like if you were in prison finding the, the biggest bully and punching them in the nose. Now he's, he's my biggest pal on, on Tiger Droppings. But anyhow, back to our story. So because we had put out the reward and because someone picked that up and put it on Tiger Droppings and because my friend John Williams had entered the thread and John's from Long Island. And, and one of the things, this is something we'll talk about another time, is sort of the cross-cultural things. And, and certainly John's very polite. And I don't think he would do anything wrong, but it is, you know, Long Island and North Louisiana are different cultures and particularly the hunting culture. So uh, <laughs> anyway, John went on there and he outed me. He said, uh, that's my friend, Matt Cortman. So my, my now friend and search partner, Thomas Matthew, had seen that uh, he had seen the thread and then he went, then he went back and found John's outing of me. Uh, so on September 6th, uh, Thomas uh, located me on Facebook and uh, he reported that <coughs> on September 5th, he'd seen an ivory bill and since our river national wildlife refuge. So I was able to go over the next day and meet with his mother and, and I, told y'all some of the story but it just it was just fantastic and we're confident that we we found the bird in the, in the area but back to the story <clears throat> and proof of concept we had kelly and i and I, lauren was with us my wife was with us that day we had done an aerial survey of the area and i'm not kidding less than a mile to the south of where thomas is sighting i had dropped a pin and said best area to north and i meant the best area in the entire state so it was pretty gratifying that we got this report of, of an ivory bill and I've since confirmed it. It's there. Now I'm not going to, we haven't found the cavity. Um, and so I, who knows if the bird's going to stay there, but uh, I was pretty excited about that. Um, so the problem it being now November, early November in Louisiana, canopy leaf out won't happen until, I mean, the leaves will still be out until well into December. Uh, which will be, and it is, deer season. So uh, we're in some, somewhat of a conundrum because we don't want to have too big a, a footprint with such a small chance of getting a good photo. But anyhow, it's nice when a plan comes together. Uh, quickly on equipment, and I won't go through all of it, but the thing on the left, the hiking stick, surprisingly, is I think the most important equipment. And I just take one, but it, it has a couple of purposes. One is, you're always walking through dark water or frequently walking through dark water and you don't know how deep it is. So it's great to have the hiking stick just to test, test the deep of the water, depth of the water. The other thing is some of the banks that you have to walk up are really, really muddy and slick. And without a hiking pole, you wouldn't be able to make it up. And then the, probably the most important thing is, as I said, well, we, we had a lot of encounters with snakes and, and then horrible, um, some of them kind of, thrilling but uh the point of the story is when you're going through deep woods in the summer in the spring it's really nice i mean i'm sorry deep grass it's really nice to have a hiking pole so that you can whack the grass in front of you just to see what's in the grass the other thing that's that's changed from my childhood are muck boots uh these are the ones that i recommend uh lacrosse waterproof hunt snake boot hunting snake boot uh it's just fantastic another thing even though i said that we can uh you can navigate through the woods at, at night. Uh, there are lots of dangers in the woods, just in the, you know, there are uh, drop-offs and holes and et cetera, et cetera. So I like to use, <laughs> excuse me, to use reflective tacks to mark my path uh, through the night. And it's really through the darkness, either early morning or late at night. The great thing is, you know, if, when you're wearing your headlamp, the, uh, the whole uh, trail is illuminated. And you can mark what you think to be uh, danger. And, you know, and I have a series of ways I, I mark that, that mean different things. Um, I'm, coming up, I'm, I do some camping. Uh, I don't carry a firearm with me. I do carry a machete. Uh, the only thing that I'm mildly concerned about, uh, and there are bears and uh, I'm sure cougars and, and snakes and such, 
Um, wild boars, <coughs> excuse me, I've never had a problem with, but if you're going to camp, I would suggest uh, camping off the ground, but I do carry mace with me uh, just for the wild boars. But as I said, uh, it's not been all horrible. This is our friend uh, Gary Bloom's place near Franklin. Uh, so we always love to stay there when we get there. But uh, with that, uh, please, if anybody's interested in helping us search, um, we can train you up pretty quickly and we were, safety is always the most important thing. Navigation in the woods is tough um, and uh, we'll make sure you know how to get around, but we'll always lead you around. And, and with our, our big efforts, which will be again, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the AM listening posts, we will walk you to your various places, but please contact us if you're interested in helping out or if you know anybody. Yeah. So this is a show that we record or we used, and it's really good. I didn't, I, I'm, I need to get it. I have a parabolic mic, but I'd, I'd like a better one. Uh, the only thing that, that we had, on, I had some wind, I think they're called dead cat uh, for wind abatement, but Lauren's looking for the, Spot. No. Zoom Handy Recorder H4N. And uh, I think my, it's a little large. I think there are smaller models now that uh, might be helpful. So th this one I, I really like, but there, there are many great options on the, the thing. The one thing I do, and if anybody has a, a good uh, opinion about whether it's best to use a boom mic to enhance your recording or a, a parabolic mic. The parabolic mic is the one that you saw a tanner with that you'll see in football games. And it's obviously you, you get a broader uh, scope and then the, the boom mic uh, is more directional. So Mike is asked, similar to your map of Louisiana showing the pinpoints, do you have maps of other surrounding places you search? Uh, I have some maps from Arkansas where I've searched uh, in one place in Mississippi. That's a good question, Mike. But I, uh, we are focused mostly on Louisiana. And honestly, we're going to uh, primarily focus on Tinsaw River National Wildlife Refuge just to start with. But I'll be happy to uh, pull those up for you sometime soon, Mike. And, uh, I think I still have those. Oh, Richard, we'll, we'll be in touch with the organized searches in Tinsaw. And I know Marty's in Louisiana. Any other Louisianians here? But again, we're happy to, and we'll have a, probably uh, in Monroe, Louisiana, at least, we'll have a, a, uh, a physical uh, training session. Uh, but again, please email us, just matt at missionivorybill.org. And so next week, we'll talk about fighting for the Ivory Bill. Um, what, oh, from John about what I think of Davis Island. Davis Island is a very interesting um, place in the, in the Mississippi, so-called because Jefferson Davis owned, and his brother Joseph owned it. So it's, to uh, answer your question, that was part of our aerial survey. It's in, in private hands and uh, difficult to get access to. Honestly, I was a bit disappointed in how... Um, about half of it was in agriculture. So it's an interesting area and we've searched just on the uh, Louisiana side, mainland as it were, from, from the island. So it, had, it has some hope. There's some great islands in Mississippi. Uh, and Richard Price has said supposedly red wolves are there. That's one of the things we're trying to get, uh, that we're always looking for. I have a quick story about red wolves. Uh, as you might know, the, the issue is, are there any pure red wolves in, in the wild because they've been bred with coyotes so much. Uh, and I, my guess is that there might not be, but, but uh, we're hopeful for finding something good in Tennessee. I know that in Union Parish, Louisiana, there was a, an injured uh, pup, which turned out to be mostly red wolf. So we have some hopes for that. Oh, Dewey Wills. <laughs> John, uh, it's so funny you should mention that. Wednesday, I'm going down to follow up on a, on a, uh, a report from there. At that, uh, we've done an aerial survey of that, and I've been throughout the Dewey Wills area, which is basically about 30 miles northeast of Alexandria, Louisiana. 
Uh, there have been lots of Iribo reports there. And uh, I've kayaked there extensively, and I'll be there Wednesday morning if anybody wants to, uh, to contact me. Oh, fantastic. Marty said about Central Louisiana, Catahoula National Wildlife Refuge, which I've looked at extensively also, is just north to the Dewey Wills we're talking about, which is a wildlife management area. Catahoula uh, has, some, has some interesting areas, too. Uh, I love all that, that part of Louisiana for ivory bills. Well, with that, I, we really appreciate y'all. Please keep coming um, and bring more people. We're next Monday is going to be a, a, a bigger event in the sense that I'll give my analysis of where we stand uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and I'm trying to talk to people with Fish and Wildlife Service as to the extinction proposal, which we are uh, vehemently opposed to. Our real position is that we're hopeful to get at least a delay in the execution of the Ivory Bill. But uh, we really appreciate y'all being here and we look forward to seeing you next Monday. Thank you so much. Good night.